First, there was the chairman of the board. Then came the king. But no act has lit up Las Vegas or the world of live entertainment like two flamboyant illusionists who make exotic beasts appear out of nowhere. Siegfried and Roy. They are monsters. This is huge. I mean, I think that you've never seen anything like this. And I'm so enthusiastic about it because this guy started with nothing. In the next hour, Siegfried and Roy tell their extraordinary life stories in rare exclusive interviews. The journey begins in war-torn Germany, where two young boys escape abusive homes to chase impossible dreams. My father was an alcoholic. Well, and it started right there. Inside, the boys got always stronger in myself, and I say, the time will come, I'm going to show them. My father went into the war as one man and came back as another. So I pretty much found my comfort in my animals. Next stop, the high seas where fate brought Siegfried, Roy, and an exotic cheetah together. I realized at that time also, in magic, you don't have to be only good, you have to be different. And Roy, with his cheetah, he made a difference. In the late 60s, they ventured into Vegas and single-handedly created the big stage magic event. Siegfried and Roy were absolutely the ones who opened the door for the freestanding full-time magic show. Along the way, the road to the top took some dramatic twists. Five milligram, it was then later on 10, 15 milligram. So I changed my personality. And some very strange turns. I was devastated. I was, my world was literally ending right there. You certainly don't want two tigers walking around New York City unattended. Finally, we'll take a trip inside their Shangri-La, the world-famous jungle palace shared by Siegfried and Roy and their magnificent collection of exotic animals. The white tigers, the white lions, they're extinct in the wild. Since 20 years, I'm trying to make a dent that we have something we can pass on to the next generation. Roy Horn is a legend. No man or woman has ever gone where he has gone. No one has ever walked in his shoes. Those animals used to walk in and out of the living room. <laughs> Unbelievable kind of existence that you would only really find in a Disney fantasy. This is the story of two lifelong friends linked by destiny and dreams who live a charmed life by day and battle an evil empire by night. This is the story of Siegfried and Roy, the E! True Hollywood story. There is never passes a day where I don't think back because I always think you have to think back to appreciate the present. That's why our audiences are so important. Our audience is giving us what we missed in our childhood, love. For Siegfried Fischbacher and Roy Uwe Ludwig Horn, past, present, and future converged in one defining moment. The year was 1960. The two adventurous young men met aboard an ocean liner. Siegfried and Roy had plenty in common. Fathers who served in Hitler's army and unhappy childhoods spent in rigid, loveless families made miserable by war. 21 years earlier, on June 13, 1939, Siegfried Fischbacher was born in Rosenheim, Germany, a village near the Bavarian Alps. Siegfried was the third child of Maria and Marinus Fischbacher. Marinus Fischbacher. My, father. My father was a painter. We had a little painting business. And then, of course, I'm born 39, so my father went to war. Europe was under siege. Food shortages and relentless Allied bombings made life almost unbearable for the Fischbacher family. On October 3, 1944, in Nordenheim, a small town some 100 miles from Siegfried's birthplace, Joanna Horn went into labor. Germany was in ruins. The cities were still in flame and the bombs was coming down and my mom had to go to the safest place. She put her other three boys down in the basement and she went on a bicycle and she went to, to my aunt and that's where I've been born. The war ended 11 months later in 1945. Siegfried and Roy watched sadly as their fathers, like thousands of other battle-weary German soldiers, returned home in disgrace. I was a very happy child actually. They told me I had a great smile, but I didn't smile inside. Because with the drama of what was going on at home, um, I was ashamed of it. I wouldn't want it to tell anybody. But my animals, I could be just be myself. I didn't have to pretend anything. My father was an alcoholic, and it started right there. You're never going to grow up to nothing. The voice got always stronger in myself, and I say, the time will come. 
Young Siegfried became obsessed with a publication he saw in a store window. I always thought when I have this magic book, then I can solve all the problems what is at home. We had no food, we had no money, we had nothing. So I bought the book and was very disappointed actually first because it was not the magic what, uh, book what I was imagining. It was a, a book with magic tricks, card tricks and so on and so on. The aspiring magician studied the techniques anyway and learned one trick, how to make a coin vanish in a glass of water. Nervously, Siegfried showed the sleight of hand to his harshest critic. My father always ignored me. I, it seemed like I never existed anyway. But I showed him this trick and he looked at me and he said, how did you do that? The first time he noticed me, the first time I was somebody. In 1954, Siegfried was finally able to see a magician perform live. His name was Kalanek. He was very uh, big at that time. And he became an idol for me. And I realized magic, it is what I, a magician, what I want to be. First, Siegfried had to find a way to make ends meet. He left school to take odd jobs at a hotel on the shores of Lake Garda, Italy. Dishwasher, waiter, bartender, but my hobby was magic. 18-year-old Siegfried also wanted a better life. In 1957, the aspiring magician left the hotel business. He hired on as a second-class steward aboard the luxury liner T.S. Bremen. One day the captain found out there's the steward who does magic, and he said, why you don't do that for the passengers? Back in Nordenheim, Germany, Roy Horn faced a dreary existence. His refuge became the local zoo. The zoo in itself was for me an anticlimactic place. Every time I saw all the animals, I felt they're the same like me, boxed up in, in, in an area where they was really couldn't flourish. And I uh, always vowed to myself, one day I'm going to do something about it. The 12-year-old animal lover made an instant connection with Chico, a young cheetah. I felt then that nature spoke to me in a voice beyond words. And uh, one day, I just simply put a leash on him and I took him for a little walk. But I realized it doesn't matter how far I was walking, it was never far enough. Uh, because neither of us was happy to go back where we came from. Ironically, the unhappy kid in Nordenheim also looked to the high seas for his ticket to freedom. And I went on the ocean liner in order to find the world who I thought would be a better one. Roy found work as a bellboy on the Bremen and set sail. The course of theatrical illusion was about to be altered forever. In 1960, Siegfried Fischbacher and Roy Horn left behind their German homeland and painful childhood memories for jobs aboard a luxury ocean liner. Siegfried was a steward and part-time magician. Roy was a bellboy who enjoyed an uncommon bond with animals. Separately, they were nothing but a couple of odd kids. Together, they would make magic. You have to prove yourself. And how can you prove yourself better than in front of an audience? During one voyage on the Bremen, 21-year-old Siegfried needed an assistant for his magic act. He called on Roy, the 16-year-old kid who occupied the cabin across the hall. And he was not too thrilled about it, but he accepted. So finally I did my performance, and afterwards we had a little drink. And I said, so what do you think? My little wheels was going, so I was saying to him, well, yeah, but the rabbit, is there anything else you could do? Could you do something with the cheetah? He says, in magic, anything is possible. With that statement, Roy came up with a bold plan. I smuggled the cheetah on the ship. I put him in my laundry bag and put him over the shoulder and uh, did my first magic trick, so to say, without knowing it. The same day the Bremen set sail, Siegfried met the ship's sleek four-legged stowaway. I realized, <laughs> boy, not only the fear of the animal, what was snarling at me, but the fear, what's going to happen if the captain or all the people on the ship find out there is a wild animal on the ship. The boy's only hope for leniency involved a grand illusion featuring Chico. I didn't understand at that time anything about magic. I just wanted to have him with me. Little did I know, uh, 
not only did Jida had to become into the, into the show, but also I, because no one else could handle him. There was a box on stage, and I transformed the cheetah with Roy out of the box. So, of course, everybody was stunned. The crowd responded with a standing ovation. The captain, however, wasn't amused. He fired Siegfried and Roy on the spot. But before the applause died down, the head of an American cruise line, who happened to see the performance, offered the illusionists and Chico a steady gig. Over the next year, Siegfried and Roy, billed as Siegfried and Partner, sailed between New York and the Caribbean, captivating audiences on every trip. In 1964, 25-year-old Siegfried and 20-year-old Roy were ready for a change. They decided to return to Germany. I said to Roy, look, let's try it, to start in show business. And I give us now nine months. We just forgot one little thing. After the war, and Germany was building itself up again, there was no more theaters. The only theaters left standing were in Bremen and Hamburg. Siegfried and Roy played both houses, but the pay was lousy, and the star of the show had a rather ravenous appetite. And we barely made a living. I mean, it was just enough to barely uh, to survive. Our cheetah had nice steaks, and we had whatever was the leftovers. But it was all all right at that time because our spirits was free. News of their extraordinary act spread, and within a year, Siegfried and Roy entertained in theaters throughout Europe. The most difficult uh, at that time was to create a demand for what we was doing. This outlandish uh, act of a wild animal, which is, uh, was a novelty at that time. But the boys were in demand. In 1966, Siegfried and Roy were summoned to perform before the royal family of Monaco. But when the big moment arrived, Chico came down with a very human reaction, stage fright. He jumped into the audience and he walked it through all the tables, right past Princess Grace, and you know, everybody went like this, and, and I, well, what can you do? You know, I just jumped off stage two and nonchalant, went right along with it, waved a little bit, waved a little bit there. The good news is, we was the talk of the town the next day. The command performance was a turning point for Siegfried and Roy. Siegfried realized their success depended on his talent and Roy's imagination. There was always this challenge. I was the magician, of course, but Roy, he was the magic. He brought me always into a situation where I had to prove myself. In 1967, Siegfried and Roy were offered a contract to join the Follies Berger, an erotic French review playing at the Tropicana Hotel in Las Vegas. Siegfried wasn't anxious to roll the dice outside of Europe, but Roy's bags were already packed. If you want to become the Pope, you go to Rome. If you want to begin, become an entertainer, you go to America. You go to Las Vegas. That's what it is. Man, that was just cool. In January 1967, the plane carrying Siegfried and Roy touched down in the heart of the Nevada desert. I had an instant love affair with the town. It's the perfect canvas a magician can paint any picture on it. Not quite. The owner of the Tropicana didn't exactly roll out the red carpet when Siegfried and Roy showed up to perform. He introduced himself, my name is so-and-so, who are you? And I was, of course, very surprised. He mean, you hired us, you don't know who I am. He say, don't tell me you're a, you're a magician, because magic doesn't work in this town. That was actually the welcome in Las Vegas. In early 1967, Siegfried, Roy, and Chico the Cheetah stepped into a lion's den, better known as Las Vegas. Here's a place that when you get off the plane, that city tells you the truth. It's probably the only truthful city in the world. It's going to try to rip you off. In the mid-60s, Vegas was a gambler's town, pure and simple. Manuel Cortez is president of the city's Convention and Tourism Authority. The only area of a casino hotel that made money was the casino. The rooms were designed to uh, provide a place for people to sleep, although they discouraged it. It was all designed to attract people into the particular property so that they would gamble. Including the entertainment. The Follies Berger at the Tropicana offered lots of girls, but the 10-minute warm-up act was unique. Siegfried and Roy and their unpredictable sidekick, Chico. Comedian Roger Ray. One day, the cheetah jumped out of the thing and fell into the orchestra pit, and you never saw people scrambling out of that pit. 
bringing their clarinets, bringing everything they could to get out of the pit. Word of the incident spread quickly. Crowds lined up nightly to see what would happen next. Roy, meanwhile, knew exactly what he wanted next, a second cheetah. I needed a, a, a friend for Chico. And then, of course, they're there, and Zippy says, what? You, how many more? The only thing missing was some added sex appeal. A Follies Berger dancer named Virginia Hantig took care of that. They approached me and asked me if I was interested in working in the act. And I was, like, very enthusiastic about it. I just thought it was great. Yeah, what do you want me to do? Well, we want you to get in the box with the cats. <laughs> OK. Virginia never worked with wild animals before, but she trusted her new bosses. The cats were very calm. They had been used to uh, Roy being with them. I really looked at Roy as this tremendous person to look up to. He took care of my money. He took care of how I did the act. After five months at the Tropicana, Siegfried and Roy signed a deal with the famous Lido show in Paris. Assistant Virginia Hantig stayed behind. I was offered by Siegfried and Roy to go to Europe and be a magic assistant. I told them that I would prefer to stay in Las Vegas and be a dancer. In the spring of 1967, Siegfried and Roy, with their two cheetahs, Chico and Simba, in tow, arrived in France ready to play the Lido. To gear up for the exciting venue, Roy convinced a reluctant Siegfried to add even more cats. The leopard became, then the black panther became, and so on and so on. And he says, well, you can't just do that. I said, oh, well, but we can put them in, we can do this and we can do that. And this for you became inventive. You had to convince your partner, it's all right. Over the next three years, Siegfried and Roy captivated Parisian audiences. But America, specifically Las Vegas, remained a draw. In 1970, 31-year-old Siegfried and 26-year-old Roy returned to the mecca of gambling. Siegfried and Roy worked without a permanent assistant in Paris, but after a few weeks at the Stardust Hotel in Vegas, they met a young dancer named Lynette Chappelle. She came originally from Africa. She trained and she learned dancing in England. For a magician, the perfect object to sew in half. I don't know if I was necessarily chosen by Siegfried and Roy, but they certainly were chosen by me. They had a magnificent cheetah they were working with. I also heard that they were hand-raising two tiny little African leopard cubs. Well, I forced myself upon that situation. The entourage was growing. But soon after Siegfried and Roy returned to Las Vegas, Chico died. Roy was heartsick over the loss of his beloved cheetah. To fill the void, he brought a new cat into the family, a big cat. And you have situations where people come into your life and they make a lasting mark. Well, Sarah, that Siberian tiger, was one of them. Sarah and Roy quickly became friends. We was playing around, she jumped me, she was laying on top of me. I was buried under 480 or 500 pounds. And before she could do what she was thinking, I was doing what I was thinking. A bit in the nose. She was started, she jumped up, she looked it, and I said, <laughs> which means it's cool, it's all right, no bad feelings, <laughs> it's okay, you know. And she went back. <laughs> we never talked to her about it anymore. But there were plenty of discussions with the show's producer, the late Don Arden, on how to get more time for the act. Walter Craig was Arden's assistant. Don scared everybody to death. He was very strong on his likes and dislikes, and if he found somebody whose performance he didn't care for, he let them know about it in no uncertain terms. But when it came to Siegfried and Roy, Arden proved to be a pussycat. Don uh, just uh, took it for granted that uh, what they asked for, they got. Arden's support and encouragement had a surprising effect on Siegfried. You heard that all your life, you're going to be no good. Now, when you grow up, and then after certain people come and say, you can do that, you can do, that can be a very frightening experience. And that's the stress, so you get ulcers, you don't sleep. <laughs> 